Hi friends, my name is Andrew Conard. I'm the pastor of Susanna Wesley United Methodist Church. I want to welcome you to our next week of the Leader Development Book Club. We are reading through Canoeing the Mountains, Christian Leadership in Uncharted Territory by Todd Bolsinger. And today, we're taking a closer look at chapter 12. Now this week, and uh, last week and this week, I'm experimenting with a little different way to engage with this content. I'll be going through uh, the chapter and uh, highlighting some of the main themes, um, sharing my thoughts on them and maybe how it might impact Susanna Wesley. So I invite you to read along. You can pick up a copy of this book uh, wherever you find books. And uh, I hope you'll join me uh, today and in the days ahead. And if you haven't gone back, you can go back and take a look at each of the chapters as we continue to consider how is God calling us in the future? How might we use this content to shape our lives together to live faithfully as a community? So today we're going to be taking a closer look at chapter 12 that's titled Gus and Hal Go to Church. And I just so appreciated the picture that uh, Bolsinger painted in this about Gus and Hal, two individuals in his, uh, in his local faith community that both were able to help one another make it to be present in worship. One was blind, the other is unable to walk, and together they were able to make it uh, to make it to worship and connect with God and their neighbors in real and meaningful ways. He shares the reality that an organization um, like the church is, is meant to be a family. And there are some really fantastic, faithful things that have to do with being a family, uh, the family of faith. This is part of the way that God designed us to care for, support one another, and care for each other in times of need. And, as you know, there are some difficult things and maybe at times some unhealthy things that come with acting as a family, with being in types of relationships that share, uh, that, that, that share uh, uh, family-style relationships with one another. And one of the things that he points out here is that sometimes we, uh, we, we face the reality that, that even if we have some clear idea about what God might be calling us to in the future, even if it's gone through a, a, a process of, of discernment and refining and casting it out and sharing it with the congregation and the community, that there is still the challenge of actually getting it done. It's not just enough to cast a vision out into the community once or twice. It has to be enacted. It has to be lived into. And he writes this. After finding a missional conviction and regulating the heat, the heat in the system, to bring change, we must enact relationally. We can't just do it on our own. Leaders cannot make change by themselves. Now, I confess that there are times when I have felt like this might be possible for me, and, and it's just not true. I, I'm right on with the author here. It's impossible to enact lasting change on your own. In fact, I believe that the most faithful way to lead change is that it is a group process, that together people embrace a new way of being a congregation, of living in relationship to our neighbors, of seeking to follow after God. So one of the things that he shares here is that there are, uh, there's really the, the, this idea that, that we can do this on our own and maybe even um, it's, it's stubbornness that he writes. And frankly, the stubbornness to think that we could lead without taking into account our limitations is as much of what is burning us out, discouraging us from get, going even further into uncharted territory, and even worse, keeping us from seeing any of the real fruit of transformation. There are times in my life when I felt that I, if just by the sheer force of will and energy and action, if I can commit more hours um, or, or get more things done, then I'm able to, to lead a group forward to make change that, that I believe that God is calling us to. And that just falls flat at times. It's my own stubbornness, and, and uh, that, as the author points out, that can sometimes get in the way of really, truly transformational change happening. And so he outlines six types of relationships that are necessary uh, for leading into the unknown, that, that, that leaders need to be aware of what they are and who they might be, and, and then being able to connect with people in uh, relational ways to be able to move forward. He writes this, part of the dynamic at, at play here is that not only does everybody have a constituency but everybody also wants to be a hero of their constituencies. We want to be in the best, look at ourselves and others look at us in the best possible light. But in order to enact change across the entire organization, we need to engage every one of these groups. Six different teams, he writes, that reflect the different types of relationships a leader must attend to in order to bring transformation to the whole organizational system. Now, it might be possible to address one or two of these to see change in, in a handful, but to really see change across the entire organization, 
leaders need to engage all six Bolsinger rights. The first are allies. An ally is anyone who is convinced of the mission and is committed to seeing it fulfilled. Now, he writes that one of the big mistakes that sometimes leaders fall into is that they think that allies are personal friends. They may be personal friends, but they may not be. Allies are people that are committed to the mission and are committed to seeing it fulfilled. It's important to pay attention to these folks. They are essential in bringing about organizational change. The next section, a uh, group of relationships that he talks about are confidants. To be a confidant, a person must care more about you than they do about the mission of the organization. They must care more about you than the mission of the organization. Now, uh, oftentimes he says that these might be people that are outside of the organization. In fact, the most healthy confidants are people that are outside of the system and can give you honest feedback as the leader who is in the system. He says one of the trouble, uh, troublesome points in organizational change as le leaders seek to go about their work is that when assessing teams involved uh, between the allies and confidants, especially when a personal relationship is involved, being clear that what are the lines here, Wh which relationship is this, and how might I engage it most effectively to bring about the organizational change that we believe is most helpful. He writes, remember in a healthy organization, the mission trumps even personal friendships. In healthy organizations, the mission is most important. It's even greater than personal friendships we might have. So it's important to pay attention. Who are the allies that I have that for whom the mission is most important? Who are the confidants with whom I can share that I am the most important as the person that is in a leadership role? The next relationship that's key to helping bring about organizational change is opponents. P potential opponents are stakeholders who have markedly different perspectives from yours and who risk losing the most if you and your initiative go forward. Opponents are nothing more and nothing less than those who are against particular the particular change initiative. Opponents. This seems pretty clear. Again, these are people that are against a particular change initiative. And often, I think it's uh, most important to th point out, as, as the author does, that, that these are people who may lose the most, who may find the situation changing the most for them, or at least will find themselves in a place where there is loss involved for them. These are important people to engage as we're seeking to bring about organizational change. The fourth group that he talks about is senior authorities. And, and these are, uh, he writes, uh, leadership, uh, you, as you remember, is not uh, the same thing as authority. Authority is your role, your position of formal power, but leadership is a way of functioning. The, the key strategy for working above those of you in the system is, again, to stay connected. Now, this might be, for me, a senior authority for me would be my district superintendent or uh, the Bishop of the Great Plains Annual Conference. Uh, it would be our, our staff parish committee, those that would be an authority over me in my role. And for you, uh, there would be different senior authorities as different leaders have people that are in positions of authority over them. These are key constituencies to stay connected with as we are seeking to bring in about organizational change. The fifth group he writes about are casualties. I don't know about you, but I don't really like to think about casualties in organizational change, and yet this is real. Bolsinger writes, in any transformational leadership effort, there will be casualties. You can't go into uncharted territory without risk. As change initiatives are being proposed, don't whitewash the losses, acknowledge them, and help to mitigate them in any way. The language of the Kansas Leadership Center would say, speak to the loss. There will be people, there will be circumstances in which there will be very real and tangible loss that's going to occur, and we have to name it. We have to recognize that, we have to be okay with it, and know that it's part of the reality of any change that's coming about. Finally, the last group that he talks about is dissenters. And he writes this, in true adaptive change, there are no unanimous votes. Someone, usually a significant number of people will say no, no matter what. There will be dissenters. He writes, for them, changing the institution is only going to be experienced as loss. So a significant amount of leadership work is spent in time listening to, understanding, and incorporating the concerns of the dissenters 
into the future of the organization. This gives the dissenting voices a place to be heard. It helps address challenges that you know that are going to come up as the process continues. It help, uh, makes it more effective in the end because remember, mission is the most important thing. Not me as a leader, not you as a leader, the mission is the most important thing. Then he talks about uh, the, the groups that make it uh, to, to high and lofty goals. He used the example of NASA as they were getting to the moon. And, and he, he outlines uh, what uh, John Cotter has put together as uh, two uh, uh, main groups of people that are necessary to bring about organizational change. And the first is the maintaining mission group. The maintaining mission group. This is the group that has to be committed to giving safety, time, space, protection, and resources to the project. At first, they don't need to do actually anything except not create obstacles and not sabotage the change process. Now that is a big task in itself, but there's a group that's going to be necessary to help keep moving the mission forward. For us here at Susanna Wesley, as we are seeking to go about this Readiness 360 process, that's going to be our church council, who is tasked with, with the overall vision and direction of the church and maintaining our mission, keeping us moving forward through difficult times. And there will be another group, um, as Cotter writes, and for us too here at Susanna Wesley, that's called uh, the Transformation Team. And he writes, this group will add effort to the inspiration. They're going to do the work of listening, learning, attempting, and yes, failing. In churches, the transformation team needs to be made up of both staff and lay leaders. This is a group that we haven't formed yet here at Susanna Wesley, but uh, the, the, the author points out that the group that's leading the efforts to enact organizational change, to, to really listen and to learn and find out what is it that God is calling us to? How can we be clear about where we are today and where God might be calling us in the future? These two groups working together will seek to bring about organizational change that's healthy and faithful and that brings and bears fruit in the days ahead. And then, after you identify these different relationships, the two key groups about bringing about change, it's then time to take action. First step, give the work back to the people who most care about it. Find the people who are most heated about the issue, issue and engage them in taking on the change. Two, engage the mature and motivated. When it's time to lead on, uh, and more and more of your energy must be invested in those who are motivated to grow and take responsibility themselves. It can't just be the leader listening uh, to those at different uh, constituencies. It can't just be giving the back work back to those who care, care about it the most. You have to pay attention to see who is actually taking steps ahead, who is uh, taking responsibility, who is moving the project ahead, who is continuing to take action on their own. And then stay connected to your critics. This is uh, especially important. Um, those dissenters, as you remember, is one of the groups to pay attention to. There will always be those who will disagree. As you pay attention to critics, as you keep them close throughout the process, you help the mission, the change efforts become better. Even though it's difficult, even though it may not be something that we'd like to do, it is essential to bring in about organizational change. And then the fourth step that ends the chapter for us today, expect sabotage expect sabotage. Now friends, that's not fun to think about and yet it's, it is part of living into a deep organizational change and we're going to turn our attention to that next week as we take a look at chapter 13 at 2 Church. We'll continue our Leader Development Book Club next week. And until then, I'm so glad that you've joined me here for this, uh, for this reflection. I hope that you're taking um, these uh, lessons, uh, interpreting the chapters in your own life, and seeking to live them out as we seek to be faithful to where God is calling us together as Susanna Wesley United Methodist Church. I hope that you have a great week.